What I want to talk a little bit about where mobility is going in cities, but I want to do it first of all by learning from the past. How have things changed over, over the, particularly the last 50 or 100 years? Um, how changes in perceptions of what cities are for and what transport are for has affected um, our perceptions, our perspectives on cities, the way we design cities, and what that's meant in terms of changing, particularly the changing dominance of cars in cities. And then talk a bit about our future challenges in terms of the new pressures we're facing in cities, new perspectives and ideas, and talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles, which people seem to be saying a lot about. This is based on European project. We've been looking around Europe at, over the last 50 or 60 years at how cities um, in a sense of change the focus uh, or, or the, the core interest of their policy and we've identified three different sort of patterns really. One around a car oriented city where essentially the city tries to adapt to the growth in car ownership and car use. We have a sustainable, sustainable mobility city where the city wants to cater for people to move around easily but not in metal boxes, um, actually as people moving around by providing better public transport, walking and cycling facilities and we have a focus on city as places, that really movement is not an end in itself, it, it's, it's a way to actually enjoy the city, to live life in the city and to be able to see city uh, as a series of places, as we saw uh, examples in Copenhagen. Um, and of course each of those different perspectives leads us to wanting to introduce different types of policies and measures. So for a car oriented city we're focused on road building, car parking, perhaps lower density and decentralisation so that we can use the network more efficiently. If we're looking at a sustainable mobility city, then we're promoting public transport cycle networks and beginning to reallocate road space to give priority, not so much to cars, but to give priority to, to public transport, walking and cycling. And then city of places, the emphasis shifts in a sense to talk about the importance of the public realm, how to promote street activities, to actively restrain traffic, to reduce the dominance of traffic in our cities, and to encourage um, transit or development, mixed use developments, things like that. And if you look at Western European cities, uh, in time, we seem to have sort of gone through, since the Second World War, we've gone through a process of trying to adapt the city to the car. The Buchanan Report was in, in response to that, to talk about the challenge of that. Moving on to saying, well, we can't accommodate high levels of cars in cities. We need to move people, not vehicles, so we'll propose sustained mobility. And then more recently, as we've heard, the idea that, that cities really, to be attractive and competitive, and challenging, enjoyable, need to promote place, that cities are, uh, need to be attractive places for people to come, work, live, and enjoy the actual physical environment of the city. Now that sequence doesn't always follow, and I think particularly we can think in this country, for example, of places like Oxford, where in the 1960s there were proposals to build an inner ring road across Christchurch Meadow, uh, and there was a big reaction against that, with a view that no, Oxford was a historic city, it should be protected. So there was a, a switch away from car orientation to the focus of place, but then a recognition to do that, we have to get people into the city in some way, and then they started building park and rides and so on. So in a sense, um, you need sustained mobility in order to promote city of spaces uh, uh, and vice versa. And here's an example. When we think of moving from a car-focused city to a place-focused city, a couple of examples. This one is, uh, Allgate, what was Allgate Gyratory, which is going to open next month as Allgate Square. You can see the top one is very much trying to adapt the city to maximise car capacity, as we did in the 1960s. Now we're saying, no, uh, our key places are really important places. We want to promote livability, attractive, exciting places to be. So we're taking out part of the, the road there, and we're actually reducing capacity and making a trade-off between improved placemaking um, and reducing the dominance, particularly of road traffic. More locally, we can see examples, uh, Waltham Low High Street, uh, what it was like, what it is now, and similarly, Bonington Square, Lambeth on a small space, just recognising that a very local environment, the importance of the, the local shop and facilities there, and actually making a feature out of that to give more of a heart to the community, but in the process, taking out some car parking space. So we're sort of rebalancing and saying, in a sense, that we've been too car dominated, uh, we're promoting sustainable mobility and also we're putting more emphasis on placemaking. That's been common, I think, throughout Western Europe. What's that meant in, change, in terms of changing patterns of car use? Well, if we think in the sense of these three stages, um, quite typically trying to adapt the city for the car and then deciding that in fact, no, we have to move people, not vehicles, we want sustainable mobility, and then more recently, well, we need that, but also it's about placemaking, reducing the dominance of traffic and movement then what we tend to find is during that first phase, as we're providing for cars, we get growing car use. 
In the second phase, where we stop providing for cars, provide new capacity and facilities on sustainable mobility, and then traffic, car traffic levels off, and then when we go more aggressively in terms of reducing traffic levels, promoting livability and placemaking, then we actually get declining car use. And from our European project, here's data from household travel surveys going back to the 70s and 80s. And this is the number of car trips per trip maker per day in those cities. And you can see in all of them, uh, London is the red one at the top there, for example, the end of the orange one at the bottom, Copenhagen is the green one. In all of those, we can see from around the late 19, mid late 1990s that actually uh, traffic, uh, sorry, car use in terms of trip makers, uh, trips per trip maker in the city uh, have actually been going down as the policies have changed and we've been taking out road capacity and so on. We've been looking at the causes of that declining modal share. Some are structural, uh, more people are coming to live and work in the city at higher density, so car use is less attractive. Changes in more uh, employment patterns. Uh, partly there are more temporary contracts, more part time jobs, people have less money. Uh, also meet more people at students in, in higher education, so less disposable income. So less ability, if you like, to own cars. But at the same time, our changing employment structures and sectors are actually promoting new high-skilled jobs that prefer to be located in high-density areas, which not only are less suited to car access, but what we find is that in London, for example, the, the, the biggest users of cycling are, are, are men, particularly um, in, in quite high-paying jobs. Um, so part of attracting uh, highly skilled people, they want lifestyles based around walking, cycling, not driving. And then what we find is that over time society changes, technology changes, people's preferences changing. So we're getting different ways of the way in which we organize our activities. And we're beginning to see uh, reductions in the frequency of people traveling to work, sharp reductions, about a third in trips people make for shopping, um, and changing patterns of entertainment and leisure, partly based on people using web, accessing services in the home, and doing things in different ways at different times. On top of that, it's what we've done in terms of the measures we've put in have also been important. So we've put in substantial investments in public transport infrastructure, walking and cycling infrastructure. We're also getting more and more market-led attractive alternatives to using the car, whether it's e-bikes, uh, floating car sharing, that sort of thing. We are encouraging higher density mixed use developments, a lot more high rise development in London, in the centre and, and at major nodes. Intensified parking management, uh, reducing the number of parking spaces, increased parking charges, and generally policies to reduce road capacity for cars, partly by reallocating road space to public transport, cycling and walking, but also actually taking out road capacity. So the last 10 or 15, central London road capacity for general traffic has gone down by about 30%, and also starting to directly charge for car use. On top of that, at a more macro level, what seems to be happening is if you look back over 40 or 50 years, car traffic levels in the city as a whole go up and then sort of level off. And the growth then tends to be on public transport because if we stop providing more road space, at some space, at point it reaches capacity, if we're investing in better public transport, walking and cycling, the growth goes on to there. And in fact, in London, where we've taken out quite substantial road capacity, actually car traffic levels are, are going down to some extent, not just leveling off. Now, one of the questions we've been asking ourselves is looking at Northwest Europe, is that if we're thinking about cars in cities and the future of cities, is this Uber evolution we see in Western Europe inevitable? Because clearly we can see that uh, in some parts of the world, North America to some extent in Australia, um, you can still get many cities that are almost entirely car based. And, and even in cities like London, once you get to the suburbs and rural areas, still a very high proportion of trips are made by car. And this is a, a, a graph taken from one of our MSC students a year or two ago, um, which is based from UITP data from 1995. It's very old data, but it's quite detailed data. This is not time along the horizontal axis, it's GDP per capita. And on the vertical axis, proportion of trips made by residents in a privatized motorized vehicle. That might be car driver, car passenger, motorcycle, whatever. And you can see three clear, cusp, uh, clear clusters. Below 10,000 um, US dollars per capita, then in fact the proportion of motorized trips are all over the place because in, in some cultures a lot of people use mopeds and so on, others they don't. But above that point, you can see at a point in time, cities of increasing wealth tend to be on two very different trajectories. The, uh, the North America example in particular, where cities become wealthier, a higher and higher proportion of trips are made by car. 
continuing the car-based city, and in the European ones in particular, cities of increasing wealth, at some point car use peaks and then goes down. Now, what are the core conditions for being able to go from car-based to mobility and place-based? You need a minimum land use density and, and activity concentration to support public transport and local walking and cycling. Interestingly, the evidence suggests you need an equilibrium between average door-to-door -door speeds by car and by public transport, or, to, or at a very local level between walking and cycling, and also strict levels on car use. So the more we go down the road of adapting the city or the city growing around the car, the more difficult it is to, to change that, or the longer it takes, because the city is morphing into a shape that suits the car and doesn't really suit um, public transport or necessarily walking or cycling. And here's some figures from London that make the point, uh, this is going over the last uh, 11 years, these are average door-to-door, -door. for residents across the whole of London, these are average door-to-door -door speeds by different modes. And you can see, roughly speaking, the door-to-door -door speeds in kilometres per hour for uh, rail and underground are something like 12, 11, 12, 13 miles an hour door-to-door, -door, roughly correspond with the average door-to-door -door speeds by car driver and car passenger. Okay, future challenges, and, and I think that the main thing here is to decide what sort of cities do we want to create and live in. Um, do we want a car-based city? Um, do we want a city around mobility, but still rather movement dominated? Or do we want cities that really focus around high quality places in which sustainable mobility can support that, uh, that vision and that realization? And I think there are a number of pressures on cities um, as we're moving forward. Uh, continuing congestion overcrowding. Um, as cities grow, then um, even public transport networks, or in Copenhagen, the cycling networks are becoming overloaded. Um, potentially, we need to think about taking stronger measures if we actually want to reduce car dominance because low hanging fruit has already been picked. Interestingly, with, with our mayors in London, other cities in, in Britain, they have much more cross-sector responsibilities. So their visions are not about mobility, they're about the sort of city they want for their citizens. We're all facing the question of autonomous vehicles and other technological developments. At the same time, there are opportunities and pressures from big data, more sensors, and also the idea of smart city initiatives. And what we're beginning to see in, in dialogues in London, other cities in, in Britain, and in other parts of Europe, and recognition that obviously transport um, and land use are linked, but more generally, transports are derived demand. So really, it's not decisions taken by traffic engineers or transport planners that determine how much traffic's on the network, other than through restraint. It's what the health service decides, the education sector decides, uh, the various different industries and sectors decide. So there's a question of can we work together? We're beginning to get stronger governance administrative structures at metropolitan level, um, and also ideas about what we can do and what we want beginning to change. And I've quickly run you through the idea that in Northwest Europe, we've, we've had a car-based city, that's moved on to a sustainable mobility city, that's broadened out to actually say the focus is on city of places. Where are things going? And one suggestion is that we're moving towards the idea of an integrated city. And we can see early examples, so mobility as a service is an attempt to look across all transport modes, door-to-door, -door, travel times, prices and so on. Can we actually integrate that and offer that as a package? Accessibility planning has been around for a while, but the idea is can we actually join up transport, land use, but also the services that are offered. So we actually offer people uh, service, whether it's physically, virtual, mobile, whatever. And of course, the sharing economy is getting to bring us together and to, to share resources and so on. We're beginning, academics have been developing new analytical methods. Sociologists have been working on socio-technical systems to show how changes in society come about by combinations of new technology, but also different social and business practices that work together. An example I give my students is if you look at retail, for example, from a transport point of view, you can say, right, 50 years ago, everybody walked to the shops every day for fresh food. Um, then they all went by a car once a fortnight to the supermarket. And then more recently, they get it ordered by van. But it's not just about the changing transport mode. If we hadn't invented fridge freezers, we'd still be having to go out every day to get our fresh food. If we hadn't um, invented the internet, we wouldn't easily be able to do internet shopping and banking and so on. So it's a combination of technologies offer new possibilities. And then it's for us to decide how to shape that. Do we want to go for a sustainable city, an equitable city, whatever? Because I think, although I presented the idea of a transition in Northwest Europe from car-oriented 
sustainable mobility to city of places. I think the integrated city, in terms of working cross-sector, using many more data sources, trying to be smart, could actually be applied to any of those different visions of the city. And there, I think, it's more and more important for cities to set the direction in which they want to go. Yeah. So finally, a couple of slides about the future and autonomous vehicles. A lot of talk about autonomous vehicles. Um, this is one image of what it might be like, etc. And I think this is a really important thing for cities. Essentially, will we end up with sort of car utopia? Will, will autonomous vehicles actually make cars uh, a more effective and a more uh, cooperative part of what we're trying to achieve for the city? Or will we, will we end up with dystopia? Sorry, it should be a why. Um, what we're told is electric autonomous vehicles will be safe, clean, quiet, efficient users of road space. We can use our time productively or enjoyably, and it will be available to all people. It'll be cheaper, um, they won't have to have a driving license. That's the positive side. But the question is, will that actually encourage the re-emergence of sort of car-based cities, if you like? Um, mobility as a service is designed to encourage more vehicle-based door-to-door mobility. So will it lead to reductions in walking and cycling? You just press a button, there's a vehicle outside for you, drops you off at the other end. Will it lead to increasing obesity rates? Will autonomous vehicles make car use more attractive, um, less stress, you've got more time to work, but as a result of that, leading to more demands for movement by, by car, leading to more demands for carriageway space, and people starting to say, well, look, you know, we don't need bus lanes anymore. People aren't using buses anymore, or maybe even cycles. So will we be back to the pressures that were in the 1960s to actually get out, get rid of trams and things like that because everybody wants to be in a, a safe, autonomous vehicle? And we could end up with pressures to actually go back to the 60s and put back segregation. So, for example, uh, the autonomous vehicles are designed not to run down pedestrians and cyclists. So in places like London, if pedestrians and cyclists know they can walk out in front of vehicles and they'll stop, then I'm afraid that's what people will do. Then there'll be pressure to say we have to put back guard railing, otherwise the traffic will come to a halt. So I think there are some quite serious things. And obviously it might lead to de decentralization of cities because if you can have a sleep in your vehicle into work or whatever, it doesn't matter maybe if the journey is an hour, hour and a half. So I think there's a general view emerging that cities need to be proactive in shaping their future and actually seeing how we can take advantage of these technologies to deliver the vision we want rather than dominating. And the way I would say that, in a sense, is uh, that we ought to use an approach that's technology-fed to deliver what, what you want rather than technology-led. Okay. And that then leads back to the question about what's going to happen to car levels in the future. Are we in post-peak car or will we return to growth? Have we reached saturation? Will there be further declines? And obviously that has huge implications for how we manage the road network and also the dominance of vehicles within our cities. Thank you very much.